You've got to be part of the environment. Every union man should be a registered voter in whatever state he lives in because he wants to be part of something. I mean, this is the primary uh, purpose of COPE, right? Not, not every member has access to the voting records of a congressman or a United States senator, but the COPE committee does. It is the right arm of any union because labor is for everybody, regardless of race, color, and creed, to educate the people on uh, what bills are for labor and which are against. What side are you on? Which 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 side are you on? Co. Committee on Political Education of the AFL-CIO. What is it? How did it come to be? How does it operate? What does it hope to do? Good questions. And oh, those voices you heard. Well, there's some union members. We asked to come, sit down, drink our beer, and rap about Cope. What is Cope? First of all, it's people working together. How? Through a committee appointed by the president of the AFL-CIO, who acts as its chairman. Now there's a director appointed by the chairman and a staff, including regional directors. That's National COPE. In addition, many international unions have a committee on political education. Sometimes it's called something else, but it's formed the same way. A committee of top union officials with a COPE director and a staff. Then there are state, local bodies, and thousands and thousands of local unions have committees on political education, working with national COPE, with the union COPEs, with each other. Now that way, there's a COPE working at each level of the government, at each level of the trade union movement. COPE's been in existence for some 200 years. As long as there's been people working for a living, there's been a political arm. Remember when they had her name was Gail. Eugene Dent from Knights of Labor? They All right, if you guys want to get back into organized labor, I can uh, give you some uh, records out of the state of Tennessee. I can tell you when we started getting organized labor back there. I... How did it come to be? Let me start at the beginning. Back in the days when the unions were weak, when whole families were herded into sweatshops to work for 12, 14, or more hours a day, when you couldn't vote unless you owned property, and few working men owned anything. When children started to work in the mills when they were eight years old, when there weren't such things as public education, or city fire departments, or free libraries, or city hospitals, or social security, oh, thousand things we take for granted today. As one poet put it, the golf links lie so near the mill that almost every day the laboring children can look out and watch the men at play. So they formed organizations like the Working Man's Party in Philadelphia in 1828. Next year, there was one in New York. Six years later, there were 60 labor parties in 15 states. Two main things they wanted then were free public education for their children and freedom from imprisonment for debt. As unions got stronger and they got into politics, they won those things, many more. And when unions were weak and they had no political influence, they lost. Anything you get you in collective think, bargaining, you can lose in legislation. Mm -hmm. You think that it would help you, Annie, if you said, well, I got 13,000 people and they're all registered voters and we influence them? Do you think that would influence them in the negotiations? I'm sure it would. I'm sure it would. Absolutely. They'd sit up and take a notice. Very strongly, Jay. Do something to pass bills that are going to be beneficial to labor. I want to support anybody that's going to do something for me because I'm a working man. I work for a living the same as you. The point is, the history of labor in politics goes back a long way for the very simple reason that American working men have discovered time and again 
that what can be won at the bargaining table can be lost at the ballot boxes. You don't believe it? Just try to think of something you've won through your union contracts, which can't be lost through the actions of government officials. Wages? You win a wage increase today, and inflation can eat it up tomorrow. What causes inflation? Unwise action by political leaders. Pensions. Who sets social security rates on which so many pensions are based? Congress. Your union? Well, they're shooting at it all the time in Congress, in the state legislatures. Your job. What happens to your job if men in public office create unemployment through ill-advised policies? If taxes favor the corporation and sock it to the rest of us? If political leaders allow business and industry to ship American jobs overseas as they have by the hundreds of thousands? And turn it over. Think of the things we've won through political action that we couldn't have gotten just through collective bargaining. Protection of the right to organize. Unemployment insurance. Social security. Minimum wage laws. Equal employment opportunities. Decent housing. Federal aid to education. Protection of prevailing wage scales. Government working for all the people, not just a few. Yeah. 32 issues he voted right for. In my local, if I have a code committee, I want them to inform well, me what's going on. If you ever get compulsory arbitration, you'll never have another collective bargain agreement in the United States for any uh, working man. Uh, this is the uh, one of the primary functions of COPE, is to get out into the community and talk to people who don't even belong to unions. But it seems like every time we have a Republican president, like when we had Eisenhower back in the early, late 40s and early 50s, we had a hell of a recession at that time. So we... All right, I know, I know. It's tomorrow that counts, not yesterday. But just let me add this final touch to the history bit. Because all of us weren't around at that time. Labor came full-fledged into the political arena right after the big depression of the 1930s. The CIO's Political Action Committee in 1943. The AFL Labor's League for Political Education in 1947. And then, with the merger of the AFL and CIO in 1955, the Committee on Political Education, COPE. Just like he says, if I tell him to go out and vote for Joe Blow, he's going to say, why? Because I think everybody in this country of ours has a mind of their own. They know what they're going to vote for before they get there. And uh, I could talk for 19 hours. I'm not going to change anybody's mind of what they're going to vote for. Now, not all of uh, the working man approve uh, with Coop's uh, endorsements of certain candidates. But we try to do our best to get the people in that's going to help the working man. Nobody's trying to tell anybody how to vote. All Cope hopes to do is to help educate people, to make sure that when a union man or a woman goes into a voting booth, he knows what the score is, how the candidates voted on important issues, what his or her attitude is on the things that matter, things like that. Well, if he knows the score and he votes wrong, or if he doesn't take the trouble to find out, well, I guess there's one in every crowd. You have good Republicans, you have good Democrats. I thought that the uh, Cope people uh, always backed Democratic candidates. Oh, no. But they scrutinize the records of all your congressmen and all your senators and see how they voted in, in Labor's favor. Cope's not a political party. It's not tied to any political party. Looks at a candidate's record, not his label. It supports and opposes candidates of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and all the rest of the parties, big and little. Cope's never been on the ballot in any election. Its officials don't hold party office, doesn't ask for patronage. It doesn't get any patronage. What else can I say? We've got troubles enough fighting for the good guys without taking on any other burdens. The problem is to get them registered so they become part of the environment and they have a right to criticize, like he says. 
If I wasn't part of the environment, I wouldn't criticize a damn thing because I don't have any right to criticize because I'm not part of it. And how come they still have so many people that are already yeah, Because they're, look, they aren't even registered to vote. Thousands of them. And when I say thousands, I mean like four or five thousand members of ours aren't even registered voters. That's something that's hard to figure. Some guys will beat their chops for days about the government, the president, the governor, the mayor, anybody. But will they take a half hour or an hour one time to register so they can vote? They'd rather complain. To be entirely fair about it, in some places the laws are rigged to make it practically impossible to register. Well, COPE is working on the registration laws. It's also working to get union members registered. They might be more women voters than they are men. The greatest part of them are made up of women because they're looking for the, uh, the basis of a good community, you know, better schools, parks, and what have you, uh, better libraries, and, and this is where they really uh, take an interest. And in the COPE committee that I have, as I said before, 40% of the people involved are women. And let me put in a plug at this point for the WAD, COPE's Women's Activities Department. They're the volunteers who put in thousands and thousands of hours on the telephones, canvassing the neighborhood, registering union members, and getting them out to vote, doing the everyday chores that have to be done if you're going to win. You know, electing friends to office isn't just television and ticker tape. It's work, hard work, and that's for sure. And like I said, a lot of that work is done by the WAD volunteers. Well, what else is there? <laughs> oh, yeah money but you can't possibly compete with the kind of money that industry spends because they've got the money to put out uh, we would expect the working people to contribute money to come back to millions and millions of dollars that are given to the politicians by big industries so they can get their candidates in office they won't give a dollar in order to protect their job you don't pay dues in the coup and so this is the way that you uh, gather your brand together so to speak so you can uh, have an opposing force to the companies the fact is, the only money used in federal elections is money contributed voluntarily to COPE. That's the law, and COPE obeys the law. In state and local elections, if the law permits, union money is sometimes used after it's been voted on at a union meeting. In some unions, if a member doesn't want his or her money used for politics, that amount is set aside and it's put into charity or into a special fund. In spite of what you may have read in the newspapers, or hear from some congressman. It's generally true in each election that the contributions of the more than 14 million members of the AFL-CIO are equaled by a dozen or so families in the United States. Well, I hope I've answered some of your questions about COPE. What it is, how it came to be, how does it operate, what it hopes to do. Now, I've got some questions for you. Did you ever register a voter? Just sit down at a telephone and call on a fellow union member and get him to register. COPE volunteers have registered voters, millions of them. It's good work to be doing in a democracy. Did you ever knock on doors to find out what folks are thinking? What's bugging them? What their problems are? What they want from their government? COPE volunteers have knocked on millions of doors, and that's good work to be doing in a democracy. Did you ever sit back late on election night, knowing that your work and your vote help put in a candidate that you just know is going to do his best to serve all the people? Folks in COPE have often. It's a good feeling, believe me. And when we lose, well, we just figure we'll work a little harder next time. Government, big, medium, little, whatever you say about it, it's ours. It belongs to the people of the United States and is going to be as good or as bad as the people of the United States make it. COPE wants to make it good. It believes it will be good if we all participate. And by all, I don't just mean the old lying guys. I mean the younger guys and gals too. Like they say, politics is everybody's business. If we register and vote and urge others to register and vote, if we take a good hard look at the issues, at the records of the people who ask us to vote for them, if we contribute even just a dollar or two to cope, government, 
our democratic form of government does work. AFL-CIO COPE does make it work. That's our responsibility. That's our challenge. Don't kid yourself. It's yours too. We're gonna roll, we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll, we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll the union on. If the boss is in the way, we're gonna roll it over him. We're gonna roll it over him. We're gonna roll it over him. And if the boss is in the way, we're gonna roll it over him. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll the union.